Hello there everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Good Game Have Fun. I'm the Hat Person and Merry Christmas and Merry Happy Holidays to all of you. Merry, you know, Hanukkah or Kwanzaa, whatever it is you celebrate. Hopefully you guys are all having a very, very good time with all of your families or friends or loved ones or maybe just loading up your favorite video game and just having a goddamn good time all on your own. I know I do most of the time on my own. <laughs> But anyway, we're not here to talk about my loneliness. We're here to talk about Game of the Year 2017. I've been very busy with university work and term papers and all that stuff, and I finally got rid of it. I'm finally on vacation time. Uh, just before Christmas, right here on the 24th, uh, I'm actually giving myself um, all the time in the world to actually list out my top 10 games of the year. Now, I don't want to make this be like a competition to be like, oh, you know, number seven is better than number eight because of all of these reasons. Not really. I would only say that the number one spot I would put on a higher acclaim to all of the other ones. But in the general sense of things, all I'm going to do is list out 10 really awesome games. Um, this is literally just like a, a compilation of a bunch of games that are game of the year worthy. You know, like if, if I had a choice, um, all of these games would be game of the year. They are game of the year in my book, um, except for number one that is just ever so slightly higher than all of these. Just in case all of you guys are wondering, um, I have a very long list of honorable mentions. And so the honorable mentions are basically games that I played throughout the entire year of 2017 that I thought were also really, really cool and really, really awesome. Uh, maybe just not as good as the 10 that I have on my main list. Um, they're still really good, but you know, there's like a few moments here and there that maybe didn't live up to my expectations, or maybe there's a couple of shortcomings that kind of, you know, don't grant it that placement on the list. And of course, just because I don't have a game on either list, that doesn't mean that they're bad games. I, you know, it could easily just be a matter of me forgetting, <laughs> you know, because there's so many games that I've played, and a lot of them are really great. So, um... Let's just head straight to it. Uh, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna move a little bit here to the side. <laughs> I'm gonna move a little bit over here because I'm gonna be like putting like pictures and video game logos and all that stuff. I, I apologize for the gorilla style of, uh, you know, video making right here. There's not gonna be a lot of editing in terms of jump cuts and stuff like that because, um, you know, I am kind of living a borrowed time right now. I do want to finish this video before the year ends and there's gonna be a lot of editing here. There's a lot of games that I want to show. On my phone, I have a list of all of the honorable mentions, I'm going to be listing all of them out. Uh, we're going to be here forever if I talk about every single game individually. So I'm just going to list out the games that didn't make it on the top 10 list, but I still played and I thought were really, really cool. And I do recommend that you guys check them out. After that, we're going to go full on onto the top 10 list. And that's where I'm going to, you know, really... We'll briefly talk about why, you know, this game is game of the year material for me. But anyway, here we go. Honorable mentions. We have Horizon Zero Dawn. We have Yomawari Midnight Shadows. We also have Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. We have Metroid Samus Returns. We have um, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim VR. I want to be very specific, not the special edition, not the Switch edition, specifically the PlayStation VR version of Skyrim VR. I'm putting it on, on honorable mentions, even though it's technically like a new game because it came out in 2017, but like Skyrim's been out for six years, right? We all know Skyrim, so I, I, I felt a little weird putting it on the top 10. But if this game was new, you know, like it, if we had never seen Skyrim before and it was on VR, this would easily be like my number two or number three most favorite game of the year. But, you know, for now, because everybody knows Skyrim and the novelty of VR is going to be an honorable mention, I do highly recommend you guys pick that one up if you have a PSVR. Now, speaking of PSVR, we also have Psychonauts, Rhombus of Ruin. We got SteamWorld Dig 2, Uncharted Lost Legacy. Tekken 7, Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, specifically the 3DS uh, remake of the game, uh, Blue Reflection, Yakuza 0, Knights of Azure 2. By the way, Yakuza 0, you know, if it weren't for all the other games I'm going to list out on my top 10, like, that one would have made it, like, for sure. Like, you know, just because of, of one or two games that were just a little bit, you know, higher, um, Yakuza 0 would have easily been, like, up there. But, you know, th there are a couple of things, uh, you know... There are a couple of other titles out there that kind of, uh, you know, kind of made that, that extra push to kind of make it on the top 10. But Yakuza 0, like, out of all of these honorable mentions, yo, Yakuza 0, awesome, gotta get that one. Um, Knights of Azure 2, that's another one on the honorable mentions list. We have Night in the Woods, 
We have South Park, the Fractured Butthole. That's another one. That's another, like, Yakuza Zero kind of one where, like, if it really could have easily made it onto the list. But because of other games, I kind of had to push it down a little bit. We have Puyo Puyo Tetris. We have Pyre. And we have Flint Hook. Um, okay, we have way more. I have, like, two different, like, separations of, of lists. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, okay. We have a bunch more. Okay, here we go. We have The Silver Case. Tokiden 2. Disc Jam. Neo. Wild Guns Reloaded, Gravity Rush 2, Dragon Quest 8, the 3DS release, um, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, the PS4 slash PS Vita versions of Undertale, Guilty Gear Exard Rev 2, uh, the No Man's Sky updates, particularly the Atlas Rises updates and all that stuff. I'm putting this on honorable mentions because everybody got the panties in a twist when No Man's Sky first came out, and I feel like the game now is so much better than it used to be on release, and I feel like those really big massive updates were a massive contributor to that so if you guys haven't played no man's sky or you still have that idea in your head that the game sucks because of the controversy and all that stuff um i do encourage you that you go and revisit the game with those updates in place because the game is so much better now um and i think the game is out uh on a sale uh on steam i think it's out for like maybe 20 bucks or so so um i do recommend that you get it give it another chance the game is so much more different than it used to be uh let's see what else we have Steel Combat, that's another PlayStation VR game, it's a fighting game, really cool. Um, you can find that one in the Japanese store and fully in English. Uh, the American release of Project Diva Future Tone, even till this day I still play Project Diva Future Tone, the Japanese version. But I do appreciate that they brought it over to North America, so that's why I'm putting it here on honorable mentions. We also have the 3DS game Pucci and Yoshi's Woolly World, of course, I'm never gonna get tired of some Woolly World, those are great games, both on Wii U and 3DS alike. Um, we have Injustice 2, Fire Emblem Echoes, Fire Emblem Warriors, the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age. I'm gonna sneeze. Excuse me. Excuse me. And finally, we have a handful more. We have, um, so yeah, Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age. We have Super Bomberman R for the Switch. We have Warriors All-Stars, RPG Maker Fest for 3DS. Danganronpa 1.2 Reload, Danganronpa V3, and last but not least, Hidden Folks. And there we go. Um, I'm probably missing out on a couple of games here and there, but, uh, you know, in that in a nutshell is uh, one, those are all out of like the many more games that I've played uh, in 2017 that I thought are, uh, excuse me, that I thought were worthy of a look. And now, we're gonna get to the main meat of this video, the big ones, the titans, the powerful forces of the gaming industry that really mean me truly, you know, believe in video games, the stuff that, that's really, really awesome, that I enjoyed a lot, and that I still uh, play today. So we're gonna begin with number 10, um, surprising absolutely nobody at all, <laughs> if you guys are subscribed to my channel, but we have Senron Kagura Peach Beach Splash. So I put this one very low on the list, because, uh, you know, in case anybody got up in a tizzy about it. But, uh, yeah, you know, the game, after you beat it and after you unlock everything, there really isn't all that much else to do. That's kind of like the one major drawback of the game. Um, is that even though, um, they take Senran Kagura, and I feel like out of all of these different spinoffs, the third-person shooter thing really works very well. Um, I enjoyed the story, it was really funny, um, we see different sides of the characters that we don't usually see, and of course it is the, probably easily the most light-hearted Samurai Kagura story out of all of the games, probably even more than Bon Appetit, but you know, the robots, the, 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 the boss fights are really fun, the weapons are fun, um, obviously, you know, with the pervertedness of the game, seeing all the cards with like sexy like pinup pictures of all the girls, it's amazing. You know, uh, being able to like change the the characters for the shop, just all of these small little details that make the experience all that much more enjoyable. And this is definitely a made with love and with all of the fans in mind because uh, Samurai Kagura has come to the point where if you play any of the more recent games, you're not gonna get it because there's so many characters and so many different things that make up the characters, little details and changes that you would only notice if you're a big fan of the games. I was kind of skeptical at the beginning, seeing like, okay, this is a third-person shooter, it might not be that fun. 
uh, or it might be a little too simple. And in fact, I would say that it is too simple, but it, uh, they definitely have the fun factor. Um, that's definitely a game that even after beating it, I do go back and, and I play it for a while. I've even streamed it after beating the story and stuff, but you kind of run out of stuff to do and it's like, uh, you know, and you can't even go online either because there's pretty much nobody playing online anymore because the game is very niche, it's not that popular, so it wasn't going to be like Call of Duty or Titanfall status where like people will be playing this game for like a year. Even now, there's barely anybody to play with. Um, the only way for you to really enjoy the online would be if you're a streamer like me, where um, you essentially like gather up your viewers and you tell them to like, you know, show up to this one place. But even then, the game is still really fun, the visuals are awesome, the fan service is great, the comedy is great, um, it still has that same Samurai Kagura vibe, and um, even Kenichiro Takaki himself has been thinking of maybe making a sequel to kind of this shooter style kind of game. So I look forward to it, I enjoyed it a lot, it's good old Samurai Kagura goodness, the music is also really great, so yeah, I feel like it, it deserves a, a nice spot in the number 10 spot. And now we're moving on to number 9. This one, I I'm really happy to have this one on my list. Uh, I'm really happy that this game still holds up uh, in the way that it did when I first played it. And, and it's Arkanoid versus Space Invaders. Uh, how much does this game cost on the iOS store? Like $5? Easily one of the best $5 I've ever spent in my life. This completely flies in the face of all of the iPhone games that exist right now. All of these free-to-play games, all of these, you know, gotcha-style games, all of these microtransactions, people are always saying, oh, you know, that's where the business is going, that's, you know, the way that everybody should do it, or that's how everybody do does it, therefore I should do it this way. Well, the people that made Arkanoid vs. Space Invaders, they said, screw that. Uh, who made this, like, Taito games? They totally didn't do that. They just charged you five bucks for a complete game with a ton of levels, with awesome gameplay and awesome assistance that you can use that can help you. Like, it's almost like, it's like Arkanoid fused with Space Invaders, but it's also kind of like a puzzle game because there's like different strategies that you can do to be able to beat all the different levels. It's not, you know, mindless, just like, you know, bouncing back the bullets and that's it. No, like you really gotta think about, you know, where, where like the, the thing is gonna bounce back and like the different, you know, powers that you can use, all the different levels that always constantly introduce brand new mechanics that are always keeping you on your toes the time limit also makes all of the levels very intense it is such a very very fun game to play that you can play for a long while like i remember like i got addicted and not a single time do they charge you more money just the five bucks and you're done you know you can just play through like a hundred levels i think uh, there are but there's a bunch of levels there's even like a little story that goes along with it which you know is not the best story in the world it's very simplistic but it's cute um, and it's something that can kind of fill in the space uh, in between levels and stuff. There's even like a challenge where you can like post leaderboards online and all that stuff. There's like an in-game currency that you can use to buy more partners and power-ups and stuff. It is such a fantastic, well-made game, and I have not heard a single person talk about it, which is a complete injustice to mankind. You, guys, If there's anybody listening to me right now and you're clamoring for a good-ass iPhone game to play without any of that free-to-play bullshit, by Arkanoid vs. Space Invaders. This game needs to be bought. It needs to be played. It is one of the best games I've played. One of the best iPhone games I've played, period, just in general. You have to play it. Along with, you know, Space Invaders Extreme and all those, like, those games are also really good, so I highly recommend them. And now moving on to the number eight spot, we have Resident Evil 7. You know, if Skyrim VR didn't exist, I would say that this is arguably the best PlayStation VR game that I've played thus far. Um, I remember I said, I think in my Game Awards video, I said that, um, you know, for me, Resident Evil was pretty much just Resident Evil 4. Like, that was like all of my knowledge of Resident Evil. And I remember when uh, the game first got announced, um, for, you know, PS4 and VR and all that stuff. As always, I got kind of skeptical because it's like, okay, I don't really know a lot about Resident Evil. I mean, I know about the first one. I know people like Code Veronica, but honestly, just Resident Evil 4 is the one that I know front and back, and I, I love that one. But I feel like Resident Evil 7 definitely surpasses that. Um, it definitely um, goes back onto that horror feel. It does kind of lose it as the game moves on. Um, it definitely, you know, slowly transitions back into that kind of action movie, you know, kind of style, uh, which is kind of the things that really ruined Resident Evil 5 and 6 for me. Pretty much the vast majority of the game, it does have a very much like a horror, almost PT kind of vibe. Um, the, the voices are very well done, the performances are great, the graphics are amazing. And of course, 
you guys know me, the biggest highlight, the thing that really makes this game of the year material for me is that the entire game is fully 100% playable from beginning to end in virtual reality. It's not like a mode, it's not like a little bit where it's virtual reality, it's not like in Samurai Kagura, you know, with, with PBS with their stupid bullcrap like photo mode where you can't do anything. No, the entire thing is in VR, you can play through the whole thing from beginning to end in VR, and I would argue that that is the definitive way to play Resident Evil 7. I mean, sure, you can play it on a regular screen, but if you have a VR headset and you're not playing it in VR, you're doing it wrong because it is super immersive. Everything becomes like a hundred times scarier when you're like actually in it. And um, just by playing the demo, you know, you can play the demo as well in VR and you can see how you like it. Um, you know, after playing so many different VR games, you kind of get a little desensitized and like, all right, you know, show me something that's a little better or more than just like a little experiment or a demo. And this really proves the extent by which VR can go. You know, it really shows us the potential of what's possible. That and Skyrim as well. Um, it's super scary, very well performed, there's a lot of cool twists at the end. Um, the story is really nice, it's very self-contained, it doesn't really, you know, overcomplicate things with like T-Virus, G-Virus, Umbrella Corporation, and all that stuff. It's just very intimate, self-contained, um, story that is very easy to understand. Now, obviously, the uh, towards the end, they do make it a little bit more complicated, you know, Chris Redfield shows up uh, on a DLC pack and all that stuff, but, um... You know, as far as, like, the regular game is concerned, you know, DLC aside, it is a fantastic game. It is really fun. And, uh, I really don't say that all that often about horror games. I'm personally not a fan of horror games. I, like, actively try and stay away from horror games because I'm just a sissy. I don't like getting scared. But Resident Evil 7, like, there's something about that game that just completely captivated me immediately. And so, yeah, you know, for a guy like me that's really not super duper into horror games to say you should get this horror game, that's saying a lot. Now, moving on to my number seven spot uh, is a game that I'm pretty sure most of you, especially if you watch my streams, you already saw it coming. But on my number seven spot, I want to give it to Nier Automata. So I had heard of Nier Automata. I had even like laid my hands on it at some point. I played the demo a long while back. I've seen some Let's Plays. I've seen like I've heard like a lot of word of mouth about this game. But other than playing the demo, I had never really, like, actually, like, put my hands on it. I never really, like, sat down and really, like, consumed the game over a long period of time. And thanks to Black Friday sales and whatnot, I got, um, a copy of Nier Automata. And I started streaming it, and we, we've been going for a while now. I haven't beat it yet. I haven't seen, you know, um, uh, all of the different endings. But as I said, I, I have actually, I've watched, I've seen a lot, a lot of these things happen. A lot of the main story beats, I've seen a lot of, you know, um... Uh, a lot of people talking about it, and even with, you know, the bit that I've played, I've already been moved. I've already been, like, emotionally, like, you know, in invested in this game. There's still a lot of, uh, a lot that this game has so much to give. Uh, from the second that I started playing it to the point where I am now, I have enjoyed it so, so, so much. Um, every single time I'm not playing this game, I'm thinking about it. It's like, well, at what point, what, what's gonna happen next in the story? What about the machines? Uh, what does this say about the world? It's, it's, um, Nier Automata is kind of like this post-apocalyptic story where, like, machines are taking over the world and all the humans escape to the moon. They evacuated, there really aren't a lot of humans left, and so you got these android dudes that are named, like, Tubi and 9S and, you know, C9 and all of these, uh, kinds of names that go in and they fight against the machines to be able to, you know, bring the humans back to Earth. Uh, in a peaceful state, but it gets so much more, you know, philosophical, it gets so much more existential and complex and emotional, like, it gets very emotional, especially with that soundtrack. There are a lot of songs that just pop out of nowhere after doing a side quest that they're like, <laughs> they, they run a cheer through your eye, that they're so, so very well made, and there's a lot of them that are like sung in German and stuff like that, and you don't really hear a lot of German singers in, um, in video games. If it's not American, it's Japanese, right? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a breath of fresh air. The graphics are beautiful, the voice acting is beautiful, um, the music is beautiful. Like, this game is beauty incarnate. It is a very ugly, run-down, almost Fallout-esque kind of beauty, but, um, it's a game that you really have to see to believe. And the funny thing is, is that there are a lot of bits in this game that are genuinely really funny and entertaining, you know, seeing like the, that Emil guy with a shop and this, you can tell that this is a Japanese game because there's a lot of like weird, almost Metal Gear Solid 
style types of quirkiness in it that really makes the game uh, have so much more character, you know? It's not just like gloominess and like emo style existentialism crawling in my skin. No, like there are generally some really fun, um, very like, you know, laugh inducing moments that I, I really do enjoy. Like it's a game that has so much to give and I really want to congratulate Yoko Taro for making such a fantastic game. I know that this game is going to be number one for a lot of people and I can totally understand, but the reason for why I have it so low, for why, like, it's not my number one yet, is probably because I really haven't played all of it. Um, I still have a long way to go before I beat it and get all the endings and all that stuff, so I don't feel confident putting it super high up, even though I just said that it's not a competition. But just, like, in my train of thought, just, you know, I said, you know, it's not really top five material, not because it's not good, but because just me, myself, I haven't given myself that assurance by playing through the whole thing yet, so... I did want to give it a spot somewhere on the list, and here it is. I highly recommend your Automata. Go get it. And I'm moving on to the number six spot is a game that I have played a significantly longer amount of, and that is Cuphead. I love Cuphead. Uh, some people have been a little reductive, saying that it's just Contra with like a Mickey Mouse animation style. And yeah, it kind of sort of is, but that's, you know, pretty much the, the long and short of it. That, that's, that's the reason for why I love it so much. It's um, it's very difficult very challenging uh, platforming shooter in the style of those old 1930s, 1940s animations. And um, some people might say that, that people are like stupid or whatever for believing that like that one thing is all it takes for a game to be really good. But hey man, sometimes, you know, that dedication to the craft is all that it takes for a game to be fantastic. I mean, you can't really talk about Cuphead without you know, mentioning the fantastic animation style, the awesome, you know, art style, the homages to all of the references, like Woody Woodpecker, or like, you know, Mickey Mouse with like, you know, the characters having gloves and shoes, and you know, just the way that all of the cartoons kind of move and bob and bounce and all that stuff. The music is fantastic. The color just pops out of the screen is amazing. Um, I have it on Steam, and whenever it does work, <laughs> it works great. I do love how challenging it is. I love how difficult uh, all of the bosses are. A lot of people were kind of being negative on the game before it came out because they didn't want it to just be bosses. Uh, they did add some like more platforming levels later on, but that ended up not mattering at all because uh, when the game came out, the thing that people always highlight is the bosses. So like, what the hell was all that complaining about, right? It, it, people ended up loving the bosses. But yeah, man, all of them are great. You know, King Dice, the Devil, that Bee Lady, um, the vegetables at the beginning, that blue blob. Like, every single boss is completely unique, memorable, and special in every single way. Like, there's never anything here that's repetitive. Every single character, every single boss, every single level is something that really pops out into my mind as, like, a sticking point. Every single thing is almost like a milestone that you get through. It's like its own little chapter. It is just a very, very delightful experience. Um... It is very difficult to just describe it in the words and hopefully convince you. Like, this is definitely one of those games that, you know, just take my word for it and you gotta see it to believe it. The game really isn't that expensive. Uh, how much does it cost on Steam? Like, 20 bucks? Yeah, there's no excuse. <laughs> you gotta get Cuphead. I, I highly recommend it. There's a reason for why people just won't shut up about Cuphead. Uh, there's a really good reason for that. that. Like, the game feels really tight. The controls are great. The fighting is great. The upgrades are great. The... Um, the art style is completely unique and fantastic. Uh, it's just something unlike anything I've ever seen before. In terms of video games, obviously, if you think about television and cartoons, and yeah, we've seen it before, <laughs> which is exactly why it's so amazing seeing it kind of adapted in game form and see it work so well. You know, you think it'd just be like a gimmick and then have the game not work very well, but like the, the game in itself, like this could easily be like a completely different art style, you know? And the game would still be fun because they worked on that you know, they worked on making that good and then making the art style really good. So it all works as a win-win. Go get Cuphead. It's great. All right, here we go. We have the second half of the top 10 list out of the way. And now we're moving on to the second half of the top 10 list. The top five. Uh, again, it's not a competition, but, you know, in my mind and my rationale, here's where I really start to bring in those games. Like those legendary games that I will remember for years on end, those games that maybe made me feel awesome, or made me want to cry, or made me want to think, or made me just think, God damn, that's a good-ass good game. Um, these are the ones. And I want to start off on the number five spot with The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky, the third. 
Now, it's really weird when I came across this game because back then, when I got a code for this game, I was still working for a website as a reviewer before I made my own website and I really started to do my own YouTube stuff um, and doing my own reviews in my own way. I got a code for that from Xseed. And uh, I felt really weird, uh, you know, playing and reviewing that one because I had only played like maybe three fourths of tri uh, Trails in the Sky one, and I even played maybe like a little bit of Trials of Cold Steel one as well. Like I had only played the one <laughs> version of all of these other Legend of Heroes series. I didn't know anything about Cold Steel two, even though XC did give me a code for that one, but I haven't played it yet because I want to beat Cold Steel one first. And so it was difficult for me to like just immediately jump onto the third one. I'm like, wait. I'm, I'm, there's like a whole other game that I'm totally missing out here on and so um unfortunately I did have to spoil myself on a few things I did have to you know kind of take a look at you know how the previous game ends so that I know how you know how the new one begins the game is very very story heavy I would say that the combat is like the last thing you're gonna be worrying about even though the game does get horrendously punishingly difficult <laughs> I don't know what's more disturbing the difficulty of Sky 3 or the fucking disturbing ass almost Silent Hill type of stories that you see towards the end like oh my god like there are a lot of stories like Tita's story that's like very heartwarming and nice you know you have um but then you have like other other characters in the story that again just by mentioning their names they can be kind of a spoiler um if you haven't played the Sky games but um yeah there's some characters where it gets fucked up <laughs> but it's so interesting like there's so many references to the previous games. You can see all of these relationships kind of come to fruition. And uh, very similar to Sunrun Kagura, actually. Bear with me on this one. I know it sounds ridiculous. But very similar to Sunrun Kagura, where, like, there have been so many games in the series where you're tied to these characters, and you relate to them, and you like them, and you know them front and back. So, like, you know, all you're waiting now is to see them in all of these different scenarios. Or you want to see time pass to see, you know, how they behave, how they change. Same thing goes for Sky 3 where you have these characters, and you kind of see what happened, you know, after Sky 1 and after Sky 2. You see them in different situations, you see, like, separated characters meet up, and, man, it, it is such a heartfelt, heartwarming game. And, you know, you still got the gameplay, you know, you still have the typical Trails in the Sky gameplay with a few added additions that, that are still awesome, but that is not the focus of the game. It is for sure the story, the characters, and getting teary-eyed with a lot of scenes. Like, there's so many, like, like just, like, I, I, just, I get the feels, you know? It's such an emotional game, and it is such a satisfying wrap-up. Like, this is the finale of a trilogy. Like, this is a, a... I feel like it could have been a little bit better, but it is still a very satisfying. I was completely happy with the way the that the game ends and stuff like that. I, I just... It's a beautiful game. I If you guys are a fan of the, the Trails in the Sky games, and you haven't played uh, the third game yet, then get it, it's on Steam. And if you have not played a single Legend of Heroes game, I highly recommend that you begin with uh, Trails in the Sky 1, and then just work your way from there. You can buy those on Steam. Uh, there's a holiday, a holiday sale going on right now. They're super cheap. I recommend you just buy all three of them, because um, all of them like directly connect one, one to the other. And by the time you finish the first one, you're going to be so captivated, you're just going to immediately want to jump into the second one. But uh, definitely start with the first one, work your way up, and it's going to be so much more effective. Uh, rather than just starting off with the third one, which is kind of sort of what I did when I had to, you know, review the game. Okay, now we're moving on to the number four spot. This one was very unexpected for me. I did not expect to really fall in love with this game in the, in the way that I did. And uh, I am talking about Sonic Mania. So I saw the announcement for Sonic Mania, and I said, okay, they're gonna do like a Mega Man 9 kind of thing. They're gonna bring it back to the old school. It's probably gonna be just a bunch of levels, Green Hill Zone and whatever. You know, it's gonna be a nice homage, a nice tribute, but it probably won't be anything else than that. It'll probably have like six or seven out of tens on the review score and all that kind of stuff. No, bullshit. This is a 10 out of 10 awesome Sonic game. It does a bunch of things that are new. The level designs are really great. The music, oh my god, the soundtrack. The soundtrack is so, so, so good. It is fantastic. Easily one of the best soundtracks. It's like Nier Automata and then like Sonic, like right here, like catching up, you know? Like it is, it, it really is a fantastic soundtrack. The remixes to all of the classic Sonic uh, songs are 
really awesome. They do bring back a bunch of levels, you know, they bring back Green Hill Zone, they bring back, you know, uh, some, some levels from Sonic 2, Sonic 3, Sonic and & Knuckles and all that, but the level design is definitely different. I do enjoy that the bonus levels are like 3D rendered Sonic levels, like they do take advantage of, you know, the, the different graphical styles and all that stuff, I think that's really cool. I like, you know, how there's alternate endings based on whether you have the Chaos Emeralds or not, I like those hard-boiled heavy bosses, those are really nice and creative. Now, I like how they have, you know, like Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine in one of the levels, like, it just gets so creative, so referential. It is such a beautiful game that is done with a lot of love and attention and caring made by fans of Sonic that know what the hell they're doing more than Sega themselves. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Sonic Forces. Yeah, it's just a game that you really got to play for yourself. It's not the same to watch somebody play it than to actually play it for yourself. I do recommend playing it on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, of course, you can play it on PS4 and all those other places, but I don't know why. I don't know what it is about the Nintendo Switch where like the game just pops so much more. Like that game was meant to be played with the Joy-Con sideways. That's pretty much how I played the entire game. Sideways Joy-Cons um, on a screen or like, you know, portable taking it everywhere. I feel like that is the way to play it. Although, you know, it's almost exactly the same on PS4 and PC and all that stuff. But um, in any way you want, like, you gotta play Sonic Mania. It's really, really good to play with all three characters, do all the levels, do the, the, the no lives run. That's what I did. Um, and just enjoy it, man. It's, it's, it's just a good-ass Sonic game in a world where people are very fatalistic about Sonic, saying that Sonic will never be good again, Sonic has never been good, and all that stuff. Well, Sonic Mania pretty much just flies in the face of all of that and says, what up? All right, guys, we're down to the top three. On my number three spot, we have Super Mario Odyssey. Now, this one is kind of a no-brainer. Pretty much the game of the year list for almost everybody, you know, for maybe the exception of a few, you know, hipster dudes out there on the internet. Um, most uh, most people are going to have, you know, Mario Odyssey, Zelda, and some other games on their top three because it is a beautiful-looking game. The graphics are fantastic. The level design, oh my god, I'm here talking about the level design of Arkanoid, I'm talking about the level design of Sonic Mania, you know, but none of those, not a single one of those hold a candle to the fantastic level design of Super Mario Odyssey. It's really funny because there are a lot of games out there, a lot of AAA games that, um, you know, want to make super hyper-realistic 3D graphics, and a lot of the environments kind of follow that same trend, you know, stuff like Assassin's Creed or Call of Duty, where they always want to make everything, you know, architecturally accurate, where it's like, no, like, the buildings look like this, and the building was like that, and so all of those buildings and all those locations were never meant to be played, you know, they were meant to have, like, a bunch of soldiers going in and shooting, you know, that's why some maps can be bad, not necessarily because they're bad, but because the architecture of those places don't necessarily fit the big action-y battlefield style of those action games, right? But with Mario Odyssey, they completely throw that out the window. They, they say, like, screw, like, real-life accuracy and all that stuff. Like, we're just gonna make, you know, all of these different worlds and just design them in the best way possible where we can have, you know, a bunch of moons scattered everywhere um, so we can have a, almost like a hide-and-seek kind of game going on. Um, having a bunch of very unique characters as well. Finally, finally, they make brand new characters for every single world that they make. They have like those little like Maraca Mexican style guys. You got those big, you know, uh, almost like polar bear, polar bear style dudes. There's so many different characters to look at, to remember, to fall in love with. I, I, I just love the way that they look. I love the graphics. The graphics are so colorful and nice. Whenever you think that, you know, these Nintendo games could not look any better, they always say, fuck you, <laughs> here are... Like, here's this game that looks like twice as good as the last one. Now, in typical Mario fashion, the platforming is really good, the levels are really good, the enemies are really good. Some of them are a little weird, like, um, because of Mario going to all these different worlds, you have, like, a world like New Donk City that has, like, actual real people to scale. But on top of that, you have a bunch of other enemies that don't feel like they're from Mario games. You have, like, a dragon, almost like a Dark Souls-style dragon, just coming out, you know, trying to fight against this this little, little pudgy plumber. Obviously, finding the, um, the moons is super duper fun, even though they do kind of give you a moon for pretty much everything that you do, <laughs> you can just sneeze and get a moon, but um, it, it's still fun, that still doesn't take away from the fact that it is super entertaining, there's always something to do uh, in every single world, even when you leave and come back, obviously the costumes is one of the biggest highlights of the game, Yeah, you have so many different kinds of things to wear, and um, probably one of the biggest things that really stick out to me with this game, that really make it special, is that there is 
almost an entirely brand new game to play after you beat it. So, you know, you need like a minimum of, uh, amount of moons to be able to keep powering up your ship to move on to other levels. But that's only the minimum. Um, there's like so many more moons that you can get in one level. And so when you beat the game once, there are certain things that happen that unlock more moons. And they spread them out all over the place. And they say, well, there's like 200 more moons. You gotta go get them. And of course, the more moons you get, the more stuff you unlock, the more things you can find, more secrets, more costumes. Um, there's definitely loads and loads and loads of stuff. And I do like how um, a lot of these items and moons and costumes cost coins because that actually gives a use to the coins. Uh, which is different from Mario 64, where coins were practically your life. I do like how they kind of reinvent and kind of change things around in a way that uh, it makes everything useful, makes everything new, everything fresh. Um, so yeah, there's definitely um, a lot more to do after you beat the game once, and even after you beat the game twice. And if you get all the moons, there's like a few extra things as well. Like the game is completely packed and chock full of stuff, and of course you got the amiibo support. And I can't see any game that's better. Well, actually, there is one that might be just a teensy tiny bit better. But again, that is just my own personal opinion. Which brings us on to number two of the list, which is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. This uh, game actually got the Game Award for Game of the Year 2017 at the Game Awards. Mario Odyssey and Zelda, they're both fantastic. They're both 10 out of 10. Awesome. You definitely have to get it. If you're going to buy a Switch, you got to buy those two games. You know, that's like a requirement. But just in my personal opinion, in my personal taste, with the kind of games that I like to play, which if you guys can't tell already, a lot of it is Japanese games, is RPGs, is kind of very exploratory stuff. Um, you know, I, I do enjoy a platformer, obviously. I'm never going to get enough of Mario platformers and stuff like that. But, you know... For me, I've always loved, like, the big, wide-open world adventure with, you know, leveling up and items and inventory and a bunch of characters to talk to, you know, like, 60-hour experiences and all that stuff. That's always kind of been my thing. And so, it, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild really spoke to me so much more than Mario Odyssey did. I really, really adored Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Um, the open-worldness of it all really uh, opens it up to a lot more possibilities. Being able to just wander around and do whatever you want, do dungeons in whatever order you want, um, get an inventory, picking out whatever weapons you want, whatever clothing you want, talking to whoever you want. It's just full-on freedom. Um, having the little, you know, parachute is really nice. Um, the story is also kind of a tearjerker as well, you know? It just kind of... You're just displaced a hundred years into the future, and it's like, okay, well, let me tell you about all the stuff that happened a hundred years into the future. Everything got annihilated. This is pretty much, again, very Fallout-esque, very post-apocalyptic. Um, Ganon is there in the castle just being literally like a giant monster snake, gotta go and beat him up. Definitely the main focus of the game is getting lost on purpose, just wandering around, coming across a quest, uh, meeting people, you know, uh, looking at all the guardians and seeing their story and all that stuff. Um, that's definitely one of the biggest highlights of the game is enjoying the fact that it's an open world game and doing whatever you want. You know, taming a horse, talking to people, doing side quests, getting money, um, building up an arsenal of weapons, items, cooking, you know, enjoying the music, um, you know, doing all those little shrines and stuff. Like, it's just... All of it just fits in so perfectly. Uh, it's almost like a Skyrim, you know? Almost like a Nintendo-branded Skyrim in a way. Uh, a lot more family-friendly, a lot less violent. Um, but it is a joy to play. I uh, do enjoy playing it, you know, with, uh, with the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller, which uh, I really enjoy, you know? Just doing this, you know, with the Pro Controller is essentially the best way to play. And, you know, playing it on portable is also not that bad either. Um, everything, you know, from portable to TV, it flows very well. Um, you're gonna get yourself a ton of tons of tons of tons and tons of hours. You know, when you go to your map for, uh, you know, Breath of the Wild, like with your little iPad thing, uh, it's gonna look empty at the beginning, but you're gonna fast forward 50 hours, and it's gonna have like a billion, like, lines and icons and stuff everywhere. Uh, it's gonna be like Far Cry all over again, but, um, yeah, it, if you haven't, you know, heard enough from everybody else is gushing about Legend of Zelda, then you're gonna hear it from me again. It is an incredible game, easily one of the greatest Zelda games made so far, and I'm excited to see what they got for the future.
And finally, here we go, my number one game of the year of 2017. Probably one of the most easiest, most unsurprising, most obvious number one that all of you are expecting out of me. And yes, I was kind of expecting it um, as well. Call it bias or whatever, but I truly believe in this game. And so yes, the most obvious 2017 game of the year award for me is Persona 5. I am absolutely in love with Persona 5. Back when I played it in April for the calendar run, obviously the whole calendar run got screwed up. <laughs> because of, you know, responsibilities and school. I just didn't really have time to record all of it. I am going to finish it, but, um, yeah, like, honestly, Persona 5 is such a wonderful game. It speaks to me on such a deeper level that, uh, it really doesn't for any other game. Will this brand new game live up, live up to my really high expectations? And fortunately, it does, and it gives even more than that. And of course, all of it is on the story. The gameplay is relatively the same to all the other Persona games. It's still turn-based, you can still capture Personas and use them for abilities, expose weaknesses, all-out attack, you guys know how it goes. But um, the setting, the way that everything is kind of contextualized is um, really awesome. You know, obviously if you haven't seen it already, you know, you're a group of Phantom Thieves and you go inside like the cognitive world of bad guys, you go inside their palace to pretty much steal the treasure, give them a change of heart, and have the bad guys be good guys, and you're reforming society through that. But there's a lot of consequences that come with that, a lot of people that are curious about that, and there's a lot of people that kind of adore you like it's some sort of cult and stuff, and things kind of go out of hand. There's a lot of social commentary. There is an enormous amount. Every single second of this game is like, you know, the game taking jabs at society, you know, whether it's Japanese society or American society or any kind of society uh, in the modern world, I guess, in the big city, because there's a lot of things that, that can apply in multiple areas, not just Japan. Um, there's a lot of political strife. There's a lot of talk about corruption. There's a lot of talk about like plagiarism, uh, a lot about abuse, about a lot about like the the young people of the brand new generation being screwed over by all of, by all of the selfish adults that only care about themselves and not about you know imparting their wisdom or their abilities to future kids. It's all just about screwing everybody over because me 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 me. And so the young people are like, you know what? Screw that. You know, it's almost like uh, Star Wars: The Last Jedi, right? You know, just kill off all of the old stuff and let's create a brand new world you know almost like that kind of like kylo ren status and especially now at this point in my life you know college students you know spending a lot of money uh you know all of my you know school lessons are basically talking about how unfair and terrible the world is so you know um it is definitely the perfect game for me to consume right now because it completely resonated with me 100% of the time. Even though there are some people that would argue that Nier Automata does the whole, like, you know, society thing better, um, maybe Charles in the Sky does characters better, um, maybe Super Mario Odyssey does design better. The, the thing that why I like Persona 5 so much is that it is immediately, automatically relatable from the second I put it up, because it, it is in modern times, um, it faces a lot of real life issues, a lot of current real life issues, and it, it just, like an arrow, like Cupid's arrow, it immediately got me. And, you know, the typical routine of, you know, going to school, taking a job, managing your relationships, getting to know everybody better. You know, you can see in my recordings, uh, uh, you know, in my Let's Play of Persona 5 that I have a lot of assumptions about a lot of people. And then all of that gets completely washed away when you start to actually know who they are. And um, all of that can be very applicable to life. All the symbolism is fantastic. The art style is beautiful. The soundtrack is incredible. You know, the combat is still really fun. It, it got kind of streamlined because instead of actually just selecting menus, you actually just, you know, have individual buttons be all of the commands. Um, the personas look awesome. You know, seeing all the demons again in 3D. Um, we haven't seen, like, 3D Shin Megami Tensei villains, uh, I mean, character models since, I think, Persona 4 on PlayStation 2. And, um, I think after that it was just, like, Shin Megami Tensei 4 and 4 Apocalypse, where they were all, like, 2D sprites again. And I said, man, I want to see, like, PS4 quality 3D character models of the demons. And you see it, and it looks beautiful. And in, on the Nintendo Switch with SMT5, dude, amazing. I love Ryuji, I love Anne, I love Futaba, I don't like Makoto, but she's still a part of the team, so I'll, I'll accept Mamakoto. Um, you know, just, just the same as everybody else. You know, Yusuke is great, and Morgana is fantastic. Morgana is a billion times better than fucking Insufferable Teddy in Persona 4. Um, I do like Koromaru, though, in Persona 3. That, that, that's still a, a good mascot to have. But Morgana is also really awesome. 
Um, you know, Haru is nice as well. All of the side characters, you know, like, you know, Nijima, Mishima, y Hifumi, uh, the Doctor Takemi, Sakura-san, like, there's so many characters that I remember in my mind, almost like they were real-life people that I actually interacted with. And when you do the calendar run, like how I do, where, like, you kind of almost play the game over a year, like, in real time, like, you just feel the attachment so much more <laughs> when you play it for, like, that long of a stretch of time. Um, you, you definitely, like, start to get attached to them inevitably. But yeah, graphics are awesome, music is awesome, gameplay is awesome. The story, it, it just completely, it just goes insane. It's like, you know, action movie, bank heist, mystery. It's, it's incredible, you know, it's a Persona-ass Persona game, and I could not ask for anything more than that. If you guys have not played Persona 5, or if you've never played a Persona game ever, I do recommend that, you, you know, you play it, you enjoy it, it's a, it's a, condensed, isolated story, you don't have to know anything about the other Persona games, but I do highly recommend that you get, you know, Persona 4 Golden, Persona 3 Fez, Persona 3 Portable. If you like Persona 5, you can get into all the other ones because um, they're definitely an adventure, they're a sight to behold, and all of them, they just feel very personal, and um, that's something that I really appreciate, something that really gets me going every day. Um, they're very inspirational stories, uh, very inspirational settings and contexts and all that stuff. It's yeah, Persona 5, it's a legendary game. Like, it is one of those legendary games like Persona 4 and Persona 3 that, like, 10 years from now, people are still going to be talking about it. And I want to be there to engage in that discussion. And there you have it, guys. That, in a nutshell, over the span of, what, how long? An hour and two minutes, an hour and three minutes. That was my top 10 games of the year of 2017. There were a shit ton of honorable mentions and uh, 10 top 10 games. Again, all of those are fantastic. But yeah, I, I am really happy with this year in games. Uh, 2017 was a very long year. I feel like it went on forever, <laughs> but um, it was a really, really good year. I definitely appreciate the hard work that people, uh, you know, took out of their lives to be able to make all these fantastic games that, you know, make you laugh, make you cry, make you smile, make you angry in a good way. And um, make you feel like you're in an adventure, make you feel escapism, makes you feel reality, makes you feel a lot of things. And so whenever people say that games are not really worth looking at or that they're a waste of time or that they're just like mindless shooting people in violence, I always look at this list of games that I got and I'm like, no, nah. <laughs> there's so much more to it. Um, Every single game is like a little universe that you can explore, and they all have their own little story of how they were made and stuff like that. Um, obviously, a lot of controversy uh, in this year in games. I'm going to leave that to other people. I know like Angry Joe has like top 10 controversies or whatever of 2017, and he's usually pretty good at pointing those out. Yeah, you know, I like to end it on a positive note and say that, yeah, man, all of these games are fantastic, and if, if you know, if you have time to spend on Christmas time or New Year's or vacation, winter break, then pick one of these games up, you know? Uh, I feel like you're going to have a really, really good time with all of these, you know? And we got a little bit of everything. You know, we got, you know, phone games. We have Switch games, PS4 games, PC games. We have virtual reality games. We have, like, a handful. There was, like, four or five virtual reality games on there, you know? Resident Evil 7, Steel Combat, Skyrim. Uh, you know, th there were a bunch. There were a bunch out there that you can really look forward to. Uh, I think virtual reality, for sure, is, like, one of those that really, like, is looking kind of bright. You know, I feel like there's going to be a lot of really awesome VR games that are going to be coming out in the future, and I really want to be there to catch up on it. One game that I did not include on the list was Accounting Plus, which just came out, like, a few days ago on PSVR. Um, I do like that one a lot. I do recommend that one as well. I didn't add, on to, uh, add that one to the list, but, you know, that, that one is also cool. But anyway... Before I, I keep going for way too long, um, I do want to say thank you very much to everybody for joining me on this video, for supporting me on the channel for the entirety of 2017. We've built up a little bit of a mini community because of my live streaming and all that stuff. We always have a bunch of regulars that show up watching me play Sermon Kagura, watching me play any other game out there that piques my interest. You know, right now we're playing Nier, we're playing Doom, we're playing Cold Steel, we're playing a whole bunch of stuff. And so it is always really fun talking to people, and uh, people are donating and stuff. Like, it's really crazy. It's really, really crazy um, how I remember back when, uh, you know, I really started to take YouTube seriously, and I had, like, 300 subscribers. And now we have, like, almost um, a thousand and a half. Like, I have, like, 1,250-something. So, yeah, man, we're getting really close. Um, my goal for this year was to get 2,000 subscribers. 
Obviously, that's not happening, but um, I'm still really happy with the amount of subscribers that I got. Um, I'm still really happy with the amount of people that are engaged in, in the videos and the streams and commenting and all that stuff. Because of my obligations with school and all that stuff, I'm obviously not able to make as many videos as I used to, but I still enjoy people constantly coming in and supporting, and that makes me really, really happy. So if you guys enjoyed this video, and if you've just enjoyed being on my channel for the year 2017, you can go ahead and give this video a like, you can subscribe, hit the bell icon, and like that, you will always be notified of everything, and you will never miss a single thing when a brand new video comes out eventually. <laughs> if you want to visit any of my social media stuff, obviously you can go down into the description and you'll see all of my links to Facebook, Twitter, what have you. Or if you don't want to remember all of those pesky uh, URLs, you only need to go to one single place where you can find everything. And that is goodgamehavefun.com. And from there, you'll find everything from my Twitter to, you know, social media buttons, to my news articles, to my reviews, to videos. Even if you want to watch my streams there, you can watch all of that live. Everything is there. So um, you can just go ahead and visit. You don't have to make an account. <laughs> you know, you just... Uh, I've been having a lot of problems with bots and, like, fake accounts. So I'm, like, accidentally, like, actually erasing you, uh, actual people. So, like, it, it, I really need to get that shit in check. But, um... Yeah, you don't, you, you really, you don't, you don't gotta make an account. <laughs> you can just visit the site and just, you know, check out all that stuff. You can bookmark the site. It's, it's okay. Uh, I'm having a lot of problems with bots right now. But anyway, um, that about does it for me. This has been a good game of fun with me, the hat person, talking to you. And I will see you all next year. Next year? Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna be making a video for the rest of the year. Um, I think, I think this is it. Um, maybe there'll be like one or two videos coming out, but don't get your hopes up. Um, as far as you guys are concerned, this is the last video of the year, so I'll see you guys in 2018, and hopefully y'all have a good one. See ya. Bye-bye.